We are moving to the, the last technical talk of uh, this symposium. It's about uh, nonlinear optics and fibers and the discovery of optical soliton and their use in optical communication. Uh, the presentation will be given by Lynn Mollenauer, who has had a long-standing and very prolific collaboration with Jim in the last uh, 25 years, maybe even more. Jim Gordon and I co collaborated in, in a study of solitons and optical fibers for, for which lasted a little bit more than 25 years. So <clears throat> in view of that, of course, can't possibly cover all that history in ju just 15 minutes. So I'm just going to limit myself to a few examples of how Jim was a wonderful teacher uh, and um, Um, how, how it was extremely uh, fruitful to, to uh, and, and, and at the same time very pleasant to, to work with him. Well, the interaction began in, in late 1979 when uh, Roger Stoll and I decided to, to, to try to be the first to observe the optical solitons uh, experimentally. But I immediately knew that we needed help with the equation you see here, the, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, <clears throat> um, which is not to be confused with the uh, equation of the quantum mechanics, which has almost the same name. Um, but which this equation, Jim said, it was fond of saying it was just Maxwell's equations in disguise. Um, the, the literature at, at the time, at that time, the literature uh, surrounding the, the uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation was extremely abstruse. So my first question to Jim was, Jim, how, how do we calculate real world numbers from this seemingly dimensionless equation? And Jim said, well, it's not really dimensionless. Um, and in fact, it, we're, we're free to choose any units we like within certain uh, constraints. So here at the bottom of the slide, do you see what Jim invented, which we called soliton units. The unit of length was, was a characteristic dispersion uh, length. Uh, the unit of time was conveniently a measure of the soliton uh, pulse width. And the unit of power uh, was <clears throat> just the peak power uh, of the soliton. As you can see, all these are uh, nicely written out in terms of other, the, the various real world parameters, such as the pulse width, the fibrous dispersion, the wavelength, the effective cross-sectional area of the fiber, the nonlinear coefficient N2 of, of, of the fiber, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, so at last, we could calculate uh, real, real, real numbers. Uh, so, well, the, the, fir the first experiment then was to uh, simply launch pulses from a mode locked laser operating at 1.5 microns through a carefully selected length uh, of uh, standard single mode fiber and to observe the emer emerging pulse shapes as a function of, of uh, power level in the fiber. Um, <coughs> So one wonderful afternoon in my lab, we got the results which you see here. Um, at, at powers below the, well below the projected soliton power, we saw the anticipated dispersive broadening, which wasn't particularly great in this case because the fiber in question was only about half a characteristic dispersion length long. But when we hit this fundamental soliton power, the, 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 the Pulse returned to its uh, original length, which in this case was six, uh, seven picoseconds, um, and so clearly we had we hit the fundamental soliton. And then, at, at, at approximately four, nine, and sixteen times that, that fundamental soliton power, we observed the anticipated behavior of the, of the uh, n equals two, three, and four higher order solitons, which uh, Jim uh, explained were just superposition, nonlinear superpositions of uh, n 
ordinary soul sounds, but where each of the soul sounds in question had different widths and, and different heights. Uh, and also the, the rather exotic pulse uh, narrowing and splitting effects you see there were just the result of some rather powerful interference between or among those, those uh, fundamental solitons. So we immediately uh, submitted a, a paper to Fizzer Rev Letters of, of these uh, beautiful results, including a very nice section on the theory by Jim, and so we were off to a, to a running start. Uh, well, let me, let me go back here just for a second. We were greatly uh, intrigued by the, the ease with which we could get extreme narrowing uh, from, from the fiber. But we asked ourselves, well, um, what if we were just to feed the narrowed pulse back into the fiber itself, I mean, back into the laser itself? Uh, couldn't we force the laser to, to produce much narrower pulses? Well, the idea worked, and it worked amazingly well. Oh, sorry, went back the wrong way. So here's what we did. There on, on the left, you see the original laser, a uh, sink pump mode locked color center laser. But then on the right, you see uh, <coughs> um, all we had to do, which was to add a beam splitter. And then we uh, carefully focused the reflected beam from the beam splitter into a, a selected length of single mode polarization preserving fiber, which then had a, a, a more or less 100% mirror at the other end. Of course, to make this thing work, we had to very carefully adjust the uh, overall length or optical length of the uh, outer cavity, uh, the external cavity, to be either exactly the same or a precise integral multiple of the uh, optical length of the main cavity, uh, the main laser cavity. And furthermore, we, we ha had to devise a, uh, a, a servo mechanism to uh, lock the two cavities together in the prop proper interference uh, relationship. But we, when we did that, we got just gorgeous pulses, and we could make them any width we wanted down to about 100 femtoseconds. We, could, we controlled the, growth, the length of the uh, pulses by simply choosing various growth, growth lengths of the, uh, of the fiber. So here, for example, is uh, uh, the outer correlation trace of uh, one of the pulses from the laser. This is a 150 femtosecond pulse. It's uh, <coughs> uh, uh, bandwidth limited, it has a beautiful shape, if, as nearly as we could tell from the outer correlation, it was a very good approximation to, to, to the uh, sedge pulse of a, of a true sol soliton. So now that we had this laser, what were, we going to, what were we going to do with it? Well, we reasoned that since uh, pulses of just a few hundred femtoseconds would have a dispersion length of just a few meters, then in a several hundred meter length of fiber, which, whose losses would still be almost negligible, we would have a really acid test of the, of the fundamental soliton because it, the, the fiber would then be many dispersion lengths long. Um, <coughs> and so we did the experiment, and in the time domain, it worked just fine. Uh, at, at very low power, uh, of course, we saw horrendous uh, dispersive broadening this time. But uh, when we got to the to soliton level, the pulse uh, came back to its, its original width of 260 femtoseconds. But in the, when we looked in the, in the frequency domain, there's something really strange had happened. The soliton pulse, pulse had downshifted eight terahertz in just the 392 meters of fiber. Uh, so we, we scratched our heads for a while, and then we re suddenly realized, we realized that this just had to be the result of a, a self, uh, self Raman effect. That is, where uh, high frequency components of the pulse would act as a pump to provide uh, Raman gain for lower frequency components of the pulse. And therefore, we would have a mechanism for constant flow of energy from higher to lower frequencies. Um, 
And we, from that simple model, we also could, through some very simple hand-waving arguments, uh, uh, <clears throat> realize that the, the effect had to scale as the pulse width to the minus fourth power, with the important result that uh, when we, although this effect was clearly very strong in the femtosecond regime, when we would go back to pulses of a few, few tens of picoseconds width as we would want for fiber communications, this effect would become almost immeasurably small. Well, but that was as far as uh, my postdoc at the time, Fedor Mitchka, and I could go. So I immediately told the story to Jim. And uh, in just one, uh, two or three days later, he came back with a beautiful model, uh, beautiful anal anal analytical model of this self uh, Raman effect. We managed to get two optics letters published. Uh, the first, uh, about our experimental discovery, and then immediately followed by Jim's uh, beautiful model. Well, all was well and good until uh, shortly after those papers appeared in print, and then we got a rather angry letter from Professor Dianov of the GPI in Moscow, chastising us for having neglected the work of his group, who had discovered essentially the same effect about ne nearly a, a year earlier. So we had to do a lot of apologizing and bowing and scraping, but nevertheless, we were, we were still very proud of, of, of our, 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 our result. Okay, Jim also helped in those early days with a, a general problem we had with explaining solitons to the general public. Here is, here is the problem. On the one hand, we would tell people you know, when, that, when the, the dispersive term in the equation acts all by itself, it can only serve to broaden the pulse in the time domain. Whereas when the nonlinear term acts all by itself, it can, it can only broaden the pulse in the frequency domain. But then in, with the next breath, we would say, well, but for the soliton, those two effects cancel each other out. And the immediate response was, how, could, how is that possible? So here is Jim's uh, elegant exp explanation. Jim said, look, before this broadening of either kind happens, the, uh, the two terms produce or att attempt to produce a phase shift across the pulse. In the case of the nonlinear term, it obviously just has the shape of the pulse intensity envelope. So for the soliton, that, that has the set squared shape, which you see there in the blue curve, <laughs> where, where for the uh, dispersive term, uh, for a set pulse, uh, the dispersive term produces the phase shift one half minus set squared. So clearly when you add the two together, you just get a constant phase shift across the pulse, which although that turned out to be important for in other uh, problems, uh, as far as the shape of the pulse is concerned in either domain, of course, a steady phase shift can have no effect on the pulse uh, what, whatsoever. Okay, now I want to get to the, the really a very important uh, result that Jim produced in, in those early days, the uh, Gordon House effect. And there's kind of an amusing story behind this. Um, Heron House was rather enamored of our soliton laser that I just told you about. And so he, in the summer of 1985, he pays, uh, paid us a visit ostensibly to talk about the, sol the soliton laser. But I'll never forget the first day when he walked into my office, the first day of his visit. And before he said anything else to me, he said, Lynn, just forget about trying to use solitons for optical communications. I've thought of this horrible effect whereby spontaneous amplifier emission produces a terrible jitter in pulse arrival times, and that will just totally wipe out any advantage the solitons might have. Well, I, I was pretty devastated by that, and I don't think I heard another word of what he said to me that morning. <laughs> but as soon as he had left, I went to Jim, and I said, Jim, what in the hell was Herman talking about? <laughs> and Jim said, well, in his very laid-back way, Jim said, <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that myself for quite some time now. So anyway, here you see what, what Jim, uh, how Jim explained the effect to me. He said, that, look, anytime you have a, a piece of noise of amplitude A, uh, which looks like the soliton multiplied by the hyperbolic tangent function, and which is in phase quadrat quadrature with it, that's, that little piece of noise will join the soliton and shift its frequency by the amount shown, shown here. And then, of course, it, the rest of the uh, problem is just a matter of using those, uh, uh, using the remaining uh, the dispersion remaining to, to the end of the fiber to convert those frequency shifts into time shifts and summing up the results. So the, and the bottom line then is that you, get, you end up with the Gaussian distribution of pulse arrival times, which is proportional to the product of the soliton power times z cubed, where capital Z is the, the uh, overall, uh, overall transmission dis di distance. Well, although the effect wasn't quite as awful as, uh, as Harriman had, had uh, made out, um, so, uh, for example, for in, in just a few thousand kilometers or so, typically it didn't amount to much. Nevertheless, because of this z cubed dependence on distance, for, for something like transoceanic transmission, it turned about, out to be a really nasty effect, and we spent a lot of time and effort finding ways to get around it. O okay, there, there, there's several things that can be said about this, uh, this, this very important result. First of all, it was the, the first example of what is really a more general principle. That is, in any simulation of a nonlinear transmission line, you must induce the noise all along the path. You, you can't just uh, calculate the, the, the pulse behavior on the one hand and then the noise growth separately and then add them together at the end of the fiber. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, obviously, for example, the Gordon House effect and others like it simply won't appear. Secondly, uh, it was a, perhaps the first time when you encountered a, a really important nonlinear uh, error. Until then, um, in principle, you could always have error-free transmission just by increasing the pulse energy to the point where it would totally overwhelm amplitude noise. But now we had a, a source of error which increased with pulse, uh, uh, pulse energy. And so clearly then, we would have, from then on, we would have to choose some uh, optimal value of, of the soliton, of the pulse energy, the soliton energy in this case, to obtain <clears throat> the minimum uh, error rate in the transmission. And third, um, many people incorrectly assumed that the Gordon House effect applied only to solitons, uh, whereas in fact it was a general, it's a general effect, it applies to everything. And you know, the only reason that, that Jim and Hermann uh, calculated the effect in terms of solitons is because it, analytically, the soliton the only, it was the only case that is, is uh, analytically tra tractable. Everything else is just a, a, a bloody mess. Okay, so here I'm going to show you now a picture that Susie loaned me. Here are the culprits who conjured up this horrible effect. <laughs> You see the happy grins on their faces. <laughs> okay, well, but it, it wasn't long before people began to think of ways to defeat the Gordon House effect. And in, in particular, Hermann uh, himself, and, and then uh, Akira Hasegawa, on the other hand, almost simultaneously, I'm sure completely independently, suggested the idea that just using narrow, narrow band frequency filters along the path uh, by, to, to dampen down the frequency excursions would then help to, to uh, rein in the Gordon House effect. Well, qualitatively, that was a good idea, but quantitatively, it had a serious defect. And that is, because the solitons lost uh, energy every time they passed through the filter, uh, the gain of the system underneath the filter peaks would have to be uh, greater than one. 
so that noise would tend to grow exponentially with distance rather than just uh, linearly so. And then I had a pretty wild idea. I said, well, what if we were to gradually shift the frequencies of the filters with distance, as you see here? Isn't there just a small chance that the solitons would be able to follow because they could generate the new frequencies re components required from the nonlinear effect, whereas the, the noise, which is uh, disorganized stuff and, and, uh, and lower intensity, wouldn't be able to follow. So it, after a while, it would be rather strongly attenuated. Well, much to my delight and amazement, uh, some quick and dirty numerical simulations show that, by golly, the idea really works. But in the meantime, Jim realized that the, the, the action of the filters on the solitons could be treated simply as a perturbation. And so he immediately set about devising a nice analytic theory of the, of the sliding frequency guiding filters which is extremely helpful because it gave you some nice, nice algebraic formulas. It was extremely helpful in, in uh, obtaining the optimal uh, performance. So it wasn't long before in real world experiments with recirculating loops, um, <clears throat> we were demonstrating error-free transmission, that's bit error rates at 10 to the minus nine or less, at 10 gigahertz per second, over distances in excess of 40,000 kilometers, which as you know is the circumference of the Earth. Okay, well, uh, let's see. Oh yes, okay, now I'm gonna take a little side, oh, let me, let me make one more com comment about this. Um, the, the, the group, the, the guys over in the undersea cable division who were my, one of my targets for this new trick, really liked the idea too. But um, un unfortunately, they rejected it ultimately because they realized that the sliding frequencies filters would interfere with their scheme for detecting uh, cable breaks and other defects. So once again, it was back to the, to the drawing board. Well, I, now I want to take a little uh, a side trip here and then we'll come back to the final phase of the Gordon House effect. Um, there was a meeting at, at Bell Labs once every month called the Forward Looking Light Guide Meeting. And, and one day I gave a talk there about uh, you know, unfortunate nonlinear interaction between pulses in adjacent WDM channels and about the fact that since real data consists of random uh, strings of ones and zeros, the uh, crosstalk would, would cause some uh, rather serious error problem. Well, Tingy Lee was in the audience. And at the end of my talk, he said, we don't need your solitons. We'll just use phase shift key. And then all the amplitudes will the same, be the same, and then your problem will disappear. Well, I didn't dare argue, debate the point right there on the spot, but I immediately, th immediately thought to myself, well, wait a minute. Pretty soon, noise is going to make those amplitudes different. And then, uh, the, the <clears throat> in the remaining distance, uh, the, the, the nonlinear uh, non non term will generate different phase shifts for the di different amplitudes, and that could be a very serious effect. So immediately after the talk, I sat down at my disk, desk and did some quick and dirty back of the envelope cal calculations. And in about 30 minutes, I convinced myself, yes, this could be a really nasty effect. But that's as far as I could go. So I immediately went to Jim, told him the story. And again, in just a couple of days, he came back with a beautiful model uh, of <coughs> my crude, uh, crudely uh, uh, stated effect. The, the final result is shown down here, uh, where the uh, variance in phase shift at, at, at the end of the transmission would just be given by two thirds the accumulated nonlinear square of the cum accumulated nonlinear phase shift divided by the, the signal to noise ratio. Well, uh, Jim wrote that up and very kindly added my name to the paper. Uh, 
and we, had, we got it published, published in Optics Letters and very promptly forgot about it. Years later, however, I was startled one time to read about the Gordon Molinar effect. What's that? Uh, sure enough, when I checked, the reference was to this old paper. What, what had happened in the meantime is that the world had discovered differential phase shift keying, a new f uh, trick with phase, phase shift keying, which gives it several dB extra uh, signal to noise advantage. Um, and as, as, a, as a result of that, um, this, this paper of ours was cited quite a, quite a number of times. And, but I, I, I wonder, sometimes I wonder if Tingy ever realized what his comment had, had, had uh, generated. Okay, so here's another picture. Uh, another pair of happy culprits. Um, this, I'm not quite sure where, where this originated. Uh, it, it's probably from St. Andrews in Scotland, or maybe Edinburgh, or maybe somewhere else in the UK. If anybody there who's from the UK can tell us where Ma Bell's Tavern are, I'd be quite interested to, to, to find out. Okay, now to the final chapter on uh, the defeat of the Gordon House effect. Um, in 1995, there appeared in a, a really fascinating paper by Ma Masatoshi Suzuki and the co-workers at, from KDD, that's the Japanese undersea cable company, whose title was Reduction of Gordon House Timing Jitter by Periodic Dispersion Compensation and Soliton Transmission. Well, it was an absolutely astounding result. In, in a trans-Pacific trans distance of 9,000 kilometers, they had nearly error-free transmission uh, at 20 gigahertz per second. Well, um, the, 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 the difficult thing was though that in that their, their techniques seemed to violate all the rules for what we knew, knew about uh, doing soliton transmission. Well, eventually it all got sort, sorted out. And so here in, in a nutshell is, is how this uh, techniques which came to be known as dispersion-managed solitons uh, works. Um, you, you have a, a dispersion map, that is a, a periodic variation of this fibrous dispersion from very large plus to minus D values uh, with a, a much, much smaller va value of, of uh, dispersion D bar. Because of the large local dispersion, the pulse, pulse uh, shapes uh, breathe like you see here, but ju just to go directly to the bottom line, um, <clears throat> if you have a large enough nonlinear compensation, you get a perfectly periodic variation of the pulse width ad infinitum. So how does this defeat the Gordon House effect? Well, the answer lies in this smaller but very it's subtle but a very important variation in the pulse bandwidth which is greater in the plus, plus D section than in the minus D section. That makes the net effect of the, of the uh, dispersion map, the dispersive effect, much greater than you would anticipate from, from D bar itself. And hence, you, you require much larger pulse energy to create the required compensating nonlinear non effect. So that was soon called uh, the energy enhancement effect. We, we all realized, of course, that you could turn that effect, uh, that idea on its head. So you could design a system uh, with just enough pulse energy to overcome amplitude noise, but where now D bar would be extremely small. And of course, it was D bar that converts the, the, uh, the frequency jitter of the Gordon House effect into, into timing jitter. So where does Jim come into this? Well, there, there's a, in the design of systems like this, there's, there's a problem because there are just so many variables to play with. The length of the dispersion map, the absolute values of the dispersion uh, the, for a given uh, bit rate, the pulse width, uh, the, the D bar itself, and so on. 
So to do all that with uh, numerical simulation would have been extremely uh, time consuming and tedious. Well, Jim realized that because the uh, dispersion managed pulse shape is always Gaussian, you could replace the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is, is a partial differential equation, with two coupled ordinary differential equations, which makes the, the problem vastly easier. So we, we were able then to, to develop a, a very simple computer program which could calculate the, the full complement of, of behavior you saw on the last slide for any given particular system in just a few seconds, no more than about uh, one minute, sometimes as much, much as two. And that enabled uh, the development of the best systems. For, uh, uh, so here, finally, um, let me just show you a the sort of results that, that could be obtained with dispersion-managed solitons. These are results were obtained with a <laughs> Uh, six, in a 600 kilometer recirculating loop, there are approximately 100 channels being operated simultaneously here at 10 gigabits per second each. But this curve over here shows what can be done with ordinary dispersion, with an ordinary dispersion uh, uh, map, dispersion uh, managed soliton map. And the, 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 the rise in error rate you see here at beyond about 4,000 kilometers, which is, by the way, the distance across the tra 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 transcontinental distance across the U.S., that rise is not due to the Gordon House effect now, but that's, that instead that was due to a nonlinear interaction between adjacent WDM channels. Well, but even that could be, be defeated. Two very bright young guys, Jing Wei and Zhang Liu, who uh, uh, Chang's office was just a few doors down from mine, devised a very clever scheme using periodic uh, group delay devices, adding those to the dispersion map scheme, which almost to totally uh, quelled that effect too. So these, these two curves show you how the error rate here is due almost entirely just to amplitude error alone. So nonlinear non -linear problems have been almost uh, completely uh, conquered. Concord. Um, turns out this result was good enough for the, for the guys over in the terrestrial uh, cable division who were putting together a, an all optical dense WDM uh, uh, um, uh, long, ultra long haul uh, system, which they called Lambda Extreme. Well, when they saw this result, they immediately adopted that is the scheme for, uh, for Lambda Extreme. I'm told that in 2004, they sold a $100 million version of Lambda Extreme to Verizon. That, that particular version covered most of the, uh, that particular system covered most of the uh, United States, the continental US. Uh, and then other, apparently other companies also bought uh, similar systems, but, but I, I don't know what the, the story is in that case, because by that time, the, the Holmdel building in which I'd worked for 31 years, it was closed down and I was forced to, re to retire. Okay, so let me summarize then uh, what Jim did uh, for, for solitons. First of all, with respect to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, Jim helped to introduce it. He showed us how to use it. And he furthermore warned of the perils tr of trying to ignore it, which uh, unfortunately a number of people had tried to do. Something I haven't be been able to talk about very much here is he also pioneered the understanding of ASE noise and long haul fiber optic uh, transmission systems. And the third thing he did was he generated several major analyses of PMD, that's polarization mode dispersion and its effects on long haul transmission. The first was stimulated by the soliton work and then later uh, he did a more general uh, th theorem with uh, Herwig Kogelnik. Okay, um, but it wasn't only what Jim Gordon did, it was the way he did it that was really important. For one thing, uh, Jim was never too busy to listen. And he listened to an awful lot of crazy ideas from, from me and from other people. 
But he knew that sooner or later he would discover a diamond in the rough, which he could then polish and turn into a real gem. And in fact, Jim, that, in many ways, that's the primary way that Jim earned his living at, at Bell Labs. And the second thing is that Jim was never superior. Um, though most of us who came to Jim for help were experimentalists. And of course, we treated him with a tremendous amount of awe. His, his tr tremendous uh, computational uh, prowess with, with awe. But Jim returned the respect. Jim genuinely respected our skills as experimentalists. Um, one time, Jim confessed to me, he said, you know, Lynn, when I first came to Bell Labs, I started out as an experimentalist. But I quickly discovered I wasn't very good at that. So that, that's why I became a, a theoretician. So he, he gave us the, the feeling that he, that he really wanted to treat, treat each and every one of us as equals. And that, of course, made him very popular and, and much loved. OK, uh, enough, enough said there, I guess. Finally, I would just like to uh, tell you about the, the book that I mentioned at, at, in the introduction. Um, Jim and I wrote this in, our, uh, in 2005 when we were both already uh, uh, retired. Uh, it was published by Elsevier Academic Press in early 2006. Um, the first, thousand, the first printing of 1,000 hard copies sold out a long time ago, but it's still available at least in electronic format. Um, a good part of this book is pure Jim Gordon. For instance, this chapter one, that's pure Jim Gordon. Chapter three is a very important chapter, spontaneous emission and its effects. It's also pure Jim Gordon. Uh, when we wrote that, I said, Jim, I want you to put down uh, all that you taught, taught me and so many others about spontaneous emission and no noise effects. Uh, and I don't want any, well, it, it can be shown that. I, I'd like you do, to do things from the ground up as, as only you can do. And so that's what, that's what he did. Another chapter, which is uh, purely his, uh, is the, the, the chapter on uh, polarization mode dispersion. Okay, thanks very much.